That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Old Way, the seventh film directed by Brett Donahue, which Saban Films is releasing January 6th, 2023. Do I know any of Brett's other films? No, I think we both uh, thought that he previously worked with Nicolas Cage, uh, who's starring in this film, but his last film was uh, Acts of Violence, starring Bruce Willis from 2018. So I'm not, I'm unfamiliar with this person as a filmmaker. Well, I did not care for this movie. Same, although, caveat, I have seen worse. Sure. The basic story is Nicolas Cage plays a gunslinger in, like, the Wild Wild West, like, late 1800s, and we see that he's reformed. So he now has a wife and a kid, and he runs a general store, so he has a nice, quiet life. But the opening of the film is, when he was back in his gunslinging days, he shot and killed a man in front of that man's little son. So, of course, we presume that we're going to meet this young boy, this kid as an adult man, wanting revenge on Nicolas Cage. And that's what happens. So one day, while Nicolas Cage and his daughter are, like, at work, that now adult man with his crew go to Nicolas Cage's house, but he's not there. His wife is there. They killed the wife, so now Nicolas Cage wants revenge on this guy. So he and his daughter go to find him. They do. They get into a showdown. Nicolas Cage does shoot the guy, but the guy shoots him and kills him. But the little daughter ends up shooting the bad guy, killing him the end. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't, and also I don't know why we use the word caveat there. <laughs> For what? <laughs> Back to, to explain that I've seen worse. I don't know what word I was trying to think of. Anyway. Oh. Uh, anyway, yeah, this movie has me confused. Um, I just... So there are a couple of... There's an interesting plot point that I don't think is used well, or appropriately maybe, which is that we find out, or we can assume that the little girl mm -hmm. who's played by... Ryan Kira Armstrong. Her name is Brooke. Brooke. That she's like neurodivergent. Like maybe she's on the spectrum. And we know that because... We keep being told that she's not... Well, one, she doesn't react to her mother's death. But everybody around her comments on... How she doesn't emote yeah. normally. And then there's a scene where her dad, Nicolas Cage, is telling her, like, you don't know how to act. Like, you don't show proper emotion. And that if you want to be productive in this world, mm -hmm. you need to mimic other people's emotions. And that scene corresponds with them trying to distract someone. So he's telling his daughter, like, you you know, I, I need you to, like, pretend like you're crying, you're upset because something happened to your mother to distract this person. And that's where I think this plot point is not used appropriately because... And I, maybe this little girl actor is not the best at her job either, but the way she's trying to, like, cry and... it. It read like it was comical. It read like it's comical. Combined with the score of this movie. Oh, the score in this movie is uh, a tool of torture. Uh, it is... I understand what it's trying to do is like go back to this, uh, th this tradition of the old odor, which is a word I hate to describe Westerns, actually, but um, it just makes this all seem very corny and hoary. I don't know. It felt like it was supposed to be a comedy with the score. Then the way this little girl was acting at times. Then the bad guy is played by um, the, the main bad guy. What's his name? The character's name is James McAllister, but Noah Legro, uh, whose father is uh, James Legro. He has his little crew, three other guys, and uh, he and Shil Shiloh Hernandez. Mm -hmm. Boots. I think that's weird casting because they kind of look too good, I think, to be in these roles. Then the other two bad guys, um, Ron Howard's brother. Mm -hmm. Clint Howard, and, Eustace. And the big guy. <clears throat> big Mike, uh, played by Abraham Ben Ruby. They, those two guys, I feel like you would cast in a comedy. Well, they seem bumbling. And yeah. every time they're on screen, it's like, it's a comedy. So I just didn't understand the tone. And Shiloh Fernandez has nothing to do. No, but... Okay, so so that was off to me. When we first... There are other clues that maybe the daughter 
might be on the spectrum because when she's at her dad's store, there's an incident where someone's trying to steal jelly beans of all different colors. And then we see her spend quite a bit of time sorting the jelly beans out by color, like putting them in different jars, which feels heavy handed, number one. Number two, the way that scene plays out, it's like the dad was upstairs all day while the daughter was downstairs sorting jelly beans. There weren't that many jelly beans. First of all, there weren't that us. many jelly beans. Also, are there no customers? Because he comes down like, oh, what are you doing? Well, that took her like a long time. To, it, po to polish the beans, sort And it's the also, jar. she starts that when they get to the store. Mm -hmm. But then when he comes down to see she's done it, they're like, okay, we're done for the day. <laughs> so, I just think the writing feels very... Well, the script was by Carl W. Lucas, who previously wrote something called The Waves, starring Justin Long, which I haven't seen. But... Yeah, there's this whole speech by the, the jelly bean stealer about, basically, I, in my notes I wrote, shit apples. These apples that are grown near a outhouse that tastes like fecal matter, apparently. Which later, the girl repeats because she's absorbed that information. But when... I was laughing because Nicolas Cage is so mean to her. Like, he just seemed... Before we kind of understand that he might also be on the spectrum and also have learned to fake emotion, he just seems real crunchy with her and when they go to open the store there's a bunch of fruit outside which drove me crazy like what they're just the attention to detail is really poor also the the man who tries to steal the jelly beans he has dirty hands so the daughter is grossed out by it and she individually cleans the jelly beans i just it's so heavy-handed that this girl is like off center mm -hmm. I, I just don't understand the point but so is he. And I, again, I think that's where it feels a little odd and clunky. And they're, well, he but, uses that to explain to her that's why he doesn't have any fear. Right. But uh, looking back, historically, when we didn't have the terminology or the information or knowledge to properly you know, speak to how people were behaving and how maybe that fed into a certain mythos is interesting. Like, he's this character that had... Uh, some kind of condition that allowed him to act this way or be this way and, and then he became infamous for it yeah to me that's there's an interesting idea there anyway another part of the story that just was so odd to me is while nicholas cage and his daughter are at his work that's when the bad guys go to his house and kill the wife so when nicholas cage and his daughter return home there are like 10 u.s marshals in his house eating his food, sitting around with the fire going, just relaxing. And when Nicolas Cage shows up, they're like, hey, sorry, we thought no one lived here. We discovered this dead woman, which also during that period, like, did women live alone like that? Like, why would they assume that she's at this house by herself? And then the main U.S. Marshal recognizes Nicolas Cage's character, Colton Briggs, is like this famous gunslinger. And then he explains to him what happened. The reason they're even at the house is because they've been following these bad guys mm -hmm. and came across this house where they had clearly killed a woman. The thing that took me out is not only them assuming that no one lived in this house but her and that they're just chilling, eating her food, but also... They spend all day, all night at this house, talking to Nicolas Cage, talking to the daughter, explaining to the daughter, like, your mom was a good woman, your dad's a killer, your mom must have been really great to turn this killer into, like, a, a, a normal husband. But they also explain to Nicolas Cage, we know who did it, and we know where he's headed. Y'all should have been gone hours ago. I know. To find this man. Why are you still at my house trying to tell my daughter anything? Mm -hmm. I hated that. I hated the way that was written. I hated that well, U.S. Marshal this, character. This, this gossipy ass uh, U.S. Marshal, the main one played by Nick Searcy, who's a character actor. You might recognize him from Fried Green Tomatoes, but... Oh, I just... The, like, the dialogue, the way the daughter... Because, again, I don't... I think it's the writing, but also this little girl's acting ability. Like, her trying to... Like, her affect's very flat and... Like, when the the U.S. Marshals explain to her about her dad, and she goes, like, oh, my father used to kill people? Like, it, it's not sophisticated enough, I think, to use this concept of, like... It's not, it's not sophisticated enough, also, when you have Ron Howard's brother talking about turkey bungholes. Right. It, 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 like, the tone is just so off. Or, or when the wife, right before she's about to be murdered, is like, you guys woke the devil. So this is, like, John Wick meets John Wayne in any number of Western and or other genre related plots. Like you brought up the Northmen or uh, there's a, a, an old favorite of mine with Sterling Hayden called um, um, Terror in a Texas Town. Any number of Westerns are dealing with the, the basic bones of this plot in the old way. 
You know, every now and then Nicolas Cage is in a movie I really like and I think he adds something to it. But this is not one of those. This is just him doing what he always does, like just in the scene, looking crazy. I think he looks real crazy in this movie. There's a scene where he's with his daughter by like, like in the woods or whatever, like by the fire at night. Mm -hmm. And the way he's illuminated, he just looks insane, which is crazy because... The wife was beautiful, mm -hmm. and the little girl's a cute little girl. So I just kept thinking he can't be the dad. That mom, the, bio, was, the biological. Yeah, the father? mom was beautiful, but I don't think she was beautiful enough to override those Nick Cage jeans. Well, could there, <laughs> those are Coppola jeans, actually. Uh, this movie could have been called Twilight of the Luddites, and I would have liked that much more. Also, getting back to what you mentioned about the the. The guy stealing jelly beans, he tells a story about this, this, this lady making apple pies. So when Nick Cage takes his daughter to go find the bad guys, they're in this new town. And he has to send her alone because they'll recognize him. And he tells her, go to like the mercantile store and do this thing. Like, you know, buy something and ask the salesperson if there are any new people there. And she walks in acting all quirky and weird. And then all of a sudden she starts reciting the lines from the man about the shit pie. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that acting and that, like, just like just trying to show that she's, uh, again, like, off-center, I do not think is effective. If anything, I just kind of, like, rolled my eyes and snickered. Uh, it's, although it's a much better film, I still had the same problems with trying to combine violence and comedy in the Old West with Ty West um, in A Valley of Violence. I didn't... Well, then there's a scene where... Nick Cage is teaching his daughter how to shoot a gun. I thought that didn't work very well. And my final note is the final scene of the film, after the little girl kills the guy who killed her dad, the marshal shows up and explains to her like how he's not going to take her in. I thought that was unnecessary. It was, because it was. <laughs> the, again, like the, the marshal has way too much prominence in the dialogue department. Uh, and, and it made me think like, oh... Was The Quick and the Dead actually a good movie <laughs> in comparison? I don't know. I mean, this review probably feels crunchy because I don't enjoy talking about movies that I didn't care for and there's nothing fun to talk about. I just think that this was a not very well-written story that included some components that I don't think it deserved to use. And it certainly didn't handle them well. I, I agree, which, you know, we're getting on borderline exploitation film there. But again, I think that's an interesting uh, angle that it totally bungles. What would you give this movie? Uh, one and a half. I would give it one and a half out of five. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.